As we now have a quorum, I call the meeting to order. Um, I have apologies have been received from Deputy uh, Michael Harty. In accordance with standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedures and Privileges for paperless committees, all documentations for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. And once again, colleagues, uh, for the purposes of the meeting, the broadcast and the recording, I'd ask you to turn your phones either off completely or to flight mode. I propose that we go to private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Is that agreed? We're now in public session, I should say. Uh, before proceeding, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statement submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website uh, after the meeting this morning. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, gentlemen, I'd now like to welcome uh, the members of NAMA who are here today. Uh, Frank Daly, Chairman, the SEO, Brendan McDonough and Martin Whelan. You're very welcome. Uh, I have received your submissions um, and if you'd now like to do uh, a summary or go through them as you see fit, um, they've been circulated to members. So, Mr Daly, I think to start. Thank you, Chairman. If I just make a, a relatively brief opening statement and thank you for the invitation here this morning. We're pleased to be here today uh, and pleased to inform you about NAMA's activity in the housing market, activity that has been positive and will continue to be positive, we believe. Uh, Brenda McDonough, the Chief Executive, will take you to our presentation in detail, but at the outset maybe let me set out in summary what NAMA has done to date. Uh, I suppose the reality is that ever since we began our operations, NAMA's focus has been on getting people into homes and certainly not out of them, and our track record proves this. We inherited about 14,000 empty homes, and working with debtors and receivers, we found tenants or buyers to live in the overwhelming majority of those. This was a significant injection of thousands of units of supply into the housing market, as we matched up empty homes with people who needed a place to live. In total, we have facilitated over 11,000 individual buyers, families, couples and individuals, who have bought homes from our debtors or receivers. And in fact, 88% of all of the homes that have been acquired from the NAMA portfolio over the past five years have been bought by individual buyers in individual transactions. And this is contrary to the perceived wisdom that NAMA has sold most of its residential portfolio to so-called vulture funds. There are some who mistakenly claim that only big investment groups have been able to buy NAMA houses and apartments. These claims are not true and are contrary to the factual position. Where we have sold houses and apartments in larger groups, it is because there were already people living in them, and the alternative of selling the properties individually would have meant removing those people. In addition, it's easy to forget that in 2012, at a time when many people were afraid to buy homes because prices were falling, NAMA introduced a groundbreaking scheme to protect people buying a home from further fr price falls. We deferred 20% for five years. And this scheme called the Deferred Payment Initiative, allowed people to buy with the knowledge that they were unlikely to lose money. It was effective, it worked, it brought confidence back. Our influence, Chairman, is often overstated, I think, because turning to NAMA's wider activities, I think it's fair to say we're in a quite unusual position in NAMA. Many organisations spend a lot of time reminding people that they are bigger or more influential than it seems at first glance. In NAMA, we often need to do the opposite. And one of our challenges is to remind people that our capacity to influence the residential property market is often overstated. We are not, and indeed we never were, the biggest property company in the world. In fact, we do not own the properties our debtors do. Our loan book, which is currently valued at about 7 billion, 
is a fraction of the size of the loan books of the main Irish banks, and one third of this loan book is outside Ireland. So we're a long way from being the biggest property lender in Ireland, let alone the world. Similarly, a lot of people think that NAMA is a dominant player in the housing market in Ireland. But consider this, there are two million homes in Ireland. Only about 6,000 of these, about 0.3%, are currently in the hands of NAMA debtors. And nearly all of these 6,000 units are currently occupied by tenants. Those which are not are actively on the market for sale by the relevant debtors and the receivers. So there's really no hidden supply of houses that NAMA is keeping from the market. By and large, the houses that secure our loans are occupied. And those that are not occupied are for sale to people who want to live in them or people who want to rent them to tenants. However, I am pleased to say that NAMA is playing a significant role in delivering new houses and apartments by working with our debtors and receivers on a commercial basis. We have already funded the completion of 2,700 new homes and we have previously announced plans to fund on a commercial basis the delivery of up to 20,000 new units over the period 2016 to 2020. This strategy has tw twin benefits for the Irish taxpayer. One is that investing in new housing will enhance the return we get from the assets in our portfolio. And the second is that we are bringing much needed supply to the housing market helping to ease the shortage that has emerged and making it easier for people to find a good place to live. We have also worked hard with our debtors and receivers to do what we can to deliver social housing. There are limits to what we can do, but we are pleased to have delivered to date over 2,100 social unit, housing units to local authorities or to housing bodies. In fact, demand has been confirmed for 2,531 such units. And, uh, Brendan will take you in more detail through those figures in his presentation. To put this figure in context, it represents about one third of all Part 5 social housing units, that's 5,700, which were delivered from all sources throughout Ireland between 2002 and 2011. Because it's worth remembering that over 550,000 new houses and apartments were built in Ireland during that period of 2002 to 2011. Yet the total Part 5 dividend was just 5,700 social housing units. In total, we have offered approximately 6,700 units for social housing purposes. That was the biggest number we could offer as any other houses or apartments that were in our portfolio were either occupied or for sale. We could only have increased this number by moving tenants out of their homes, and this would simply have displaced one group of people by giving their homes to another group, and it would make have made no sense. The difference between the 6,700 that we offered and the 2,500 is explained, of course, by the fact that the final decision on what properties go into social housing is quite properly a matter for the local authorities and the housing bodies. We understand why they make such decisions, primarily because the units were not in the locations where social housing was needed, or they were too big or too small for their requirements. As far as NAMA is concerned, by the way, we are always keen that any social housing we deliver will be to a high standard. So, for example, in cases where units were incomplete, we have spent more than 100 million to complete them. We also spent another 160 million to deliver social housing through National Asset Residential Property Services, which is a special purpose company that we set up to expedite the delivery of these units. It buys the properties from the debtors and then leases them to the voluntary or cooperative housing bodies. And that, of course, puts less of a cash strain on those bodies. In short, we've made a significant input to social housing delivery to date, and we'll continue to do this where we possibly can. Let me conclude by saying that some people will have us believe there are easy answers to all of Ireland's housing problems, and I'm sure uh, this committee, having uh, been sitting now in several sessions, knows that uh, that is not the case. We don't agree either. There are barriers, which we can discuss later, but by working together, many of these can be overcome. And I welcome the deliberations of this committee, which I believe will identify and shape sustainable policy solutions. NAMA will deliver 20,000 residential units by 2020 and make a meaningful impact on housing supply. But any analysis that claims we can deliver all the homes that people need is mistaken. We have a mandate to invest commercially, use taxpayer money wisely, 
and work professionally with our debtors and receivers to deliver the best financial return that can be achieved from the assets in our portfolio. Our plan to deliver 20,000 new units is ambitious and challenging, but we will do it, and we will do it in a manner consistent with our mandate. However, in terms of the important work of this committee, that 20,000 represents about one-fifth of the estimated 100,000 units demanded between now and 2020, so other players will have to make a contribution. We want to get more people into more homes, and we have every confidence that we will do so. And if you like, Chairman, I can now hand over to Brendan McDonough to outline in more detail just how we will go about that. Thank you very much, Mr Daly. Mr McDonough. <coughs> Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, uh, committee members. Uh, in terms of the presentation, which I believe you, you all have, should have a copy in front of, uh, I, I run quickly through it just to bring, that, bring out some of, the, some of the key points. As the Chairman said, what we acquired from the banks was actually loans. Uh, we don't actually own the properties. The debtors who took out the loans actually own the properties, and that's something that has to be kept in, kept in, kept in mind. In terms of NAMA's mandate, Section 10 of the NAMA Act is very clear. Uh, we have to obtain the best achievable financial return for the state. We have to deal expeditiously with the assets acquired for it, and we have to protect or otherwise enhance the value of those assets. So, therefore, what that boils down to is that the NAMA Board is obliged to follow a clear commercial mandate. In terms of uh, our acquisition process, we acquired uh, some land and, and development, which was a security for property rated loans, mainly in 2010 and 2011. We did not acquire uh, a residential mortgages owned occupied by to let. There were some incidental residential mortgages which were attached to large debtor loans, but they, you know, they weren't a big part. Uh, there was about 14,000 completed residential units in Ireland, which is about one, less than 1% of the 2 million housing stock at apartments. And when we acquired them, they were built, but they weren't occupied. And 15% of these, uh, of these 14,000, we worked with the debtors to create in income flow very quickly by uh, effectively getting tenanted after NAM acquired the loans because effectively there wasn't a market to be able to sell them into. We also offered, as, as I said, uh, over 6,600 uh, units uh, uh, to the local authorities and the housing agency for social housing. Uh, between the time that we offered them and the time they actually confirmed demand, obviously in a live portfolio, uh, the debtor, debtor. Some of these were either sold or let in the market, and about two and a half thousand uh, of those uh, were not deemed suitable by the local authorities and, and the housing agency for various reasons. However, I suppose in terms of that, two, two and a half thousand of the band has been confirmed. Uh, today, uh, when we did the presentation about 2042, it's now up to 2100, uh, uh, effectively have, ha, have been contracted and, and be, be delivered. And there's about another 500 which effectively are currently under active negotiations. Uh, in terms of that, uh, you know, we, ha we have put money into uh, incomplete housing, about 100 million to date, to actually bring them up to standards, current uh, building standards, I may add. And uh, we have made use of, uh, as the chairman outlined here, a vehicle where we buy the units at market value from the debtors and receivers, and then we enter into leases with the approved housing bodies. And I suppose one of the initiatives that we did engage with at the start is that when we got involved in this, there was a different form of lease for each approved housing body. And we went and set up a standardised lease that goes to everybody rather than having different leases, and, and uh, that has worked out uh, very, very, very well. In terms of social housing, uh, I suppose there's some key facts to sort of dispel some of the myths out there. Anything that, was, that could be offered in the portfolio, we did offer up. We have absolutely no co control over the take-up of the properties that we, that we offered up. That's a decision of the local authorities and the housing agency. We will uh, make whatever funding is needed to make the houses habitable. Sometimes this, this requires uh, money to, uh, to go into uh, re uh, remediation plans, which have to be agreed, agreed, with, the agreed, with, the agreed with the local authorities, and that's fine. We will not offer a product to any tenant which actually does not meet uh, the requisite uh, standards. There's no point putting somebody in, 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 in bad accommodation. And uh, where the demand is not confirmed by the local authority for whatever reason, our experience has been that the private sector market then rinse, primarily rinse uh, those properties from uh, uh, our, 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 our debtors. And that's, as I said, the 6,000 units that remain in our portfolio. The occupancy rate is up at 
percent, and the other one percent is frictional as people move in, it, move in, it, move in and out. And uh, I suppose, in terms of the figures around that. Uh, as we know, because of budgetary constraints, the local authorities haven't had the capital, the capital available to them from central government to buy units, uh, but sometimes the approved housing bodies might have some capital available to them. So to date, about 39% has been by direct sale, 6% has been by direct lease, and 55% has been effectively by us buying them and, uh, and us leasing them uh, directly uh, to, the, to the approved housing bodies. And I suppose that's becoming a bigger feature of that, especially during 2015, where effectively 73% of all the social housing that, that we leased during 2015 was, was through us buying them in our subsidiary and doing the lease with the approved housing bodies. The next two pages set out by county, and don't plan to go through them in detail, you can come back and not out with your questions on them, uh, in terms of uh, how the 6,000 units were, were offered, 6,600 units were offered across each local authority, where the demand is confirmed and what has been, uh, what has been delivered to date. If I go forward, maybe to page 10, it has some uh, pictures of some of the units that have actually been delivered. Uh, I mean, uh, the reality is that this, uh, this accommodation is, is done to a very high, high quality and is finished out. And I suppose on page 11 of the presentation, uh, a key point here is that our debtors have sold 12,781 individual homes to people since 2010, since we acquired the loans. And 11,219 of those have been bought by individual buyers, and 1,562 have been effectively bought uh, uh, by people who are what we call uh, professional buyers in the market, who effectively are who do long-term uh, uh, leasing, like uh, the Reeds and uh, and Kendi Wilson. In terms of the sale uh, of loans, there's some key principles around this. Uh, uh, we don't ask our debtors receivers to seek vacant possession of residential property if, if a loan book is going up for sale. Uh, we, ins uh, we go through the portfolio to, to, to see if there's any more properties that can be taken out to be used for, uh, for, social, for social housing. Uh, we also go through and look at the land bank with each, each of those portfolio to see if there's any land bank in there which actually would make commercial sense for us to, to fund. And uh, I suppose the, the, the reality is that uh, in terms of our biggest uh, loan book sale, which was last year Project Arrow, uh, we, before that went to the market, we had took out 425 properties, uh, which was used for, so, for, for uh, social, house, social housing purposes based on demand uh, set by the, the housing agency approved housing body. I won't go forward, actually, I suppose, in terms of, in terms of page 16. Uh, within the NAMA portfolio, uh, the land bank held by, our, held by our debtors is about 2,800 hectares. It's broken out there uh, by county. As you can see, the biggest elements are in Dublin, Kildare, uh, Mead, uh, and, and Wicklow. So, effectively, our, our, our portfolio is, 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 and Limerick uh, is very urban-centric. Urban uh, in terms of us funding the 20,000 uh, uh, units by in 2020, about 1,500 hectares of that 2,800 will be required. And uh, I suppose the, the biggest issue in terms of residual land in the portfolio uh, is that there are some significant barriers to that land, uh, whether it's to achieve planning, commercial viability. But a big issue is, is infrastructure deficit, uh, you know, lack of roads, uh, 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 sewerage and, and water, and that's a, a, something I'll come on to in a moment. On page 17, we set out here a, a graph, actually, which basically would show you here uh, in terms of uh, house prices, which are represented by the red line, and, and the blue line represents construction costs. So even you would see from 2009 to date, construction costs are being relatively stable. And obviously, as the, the country went into recession, house prices dropped significantly. And that in the period from effectively 2011 to mid-2014, it was not commercially viable anywhere to actually uh, uh, you know, put uh, money into uh, uh, building uh, uh, new, uh, new houses. And that's something that we could not do under the NAMA, under, 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 under the NAMA legislation. At present, it has effectively flatlined out, prices rose, but they effectively are, are, are plateaued now, a lot of it linked to the central bank uh, mortgage measures, which effectively are a welcome influence, I may add. Uh, but uh, effectively, at present, uh, you know, uh, you would actually see, if you go to the next page, uh, that effectively from 2014 onwards, 
it become profitable to build a house based on the sales price that can be achieved. And the, the profit, the typical profit on average that we're seeing across our schemes in Dublin, the Dublin Bells, Cork or Galway, is that uh, it is ca you are capable of making at present around €20,000 profit per unit. I know the CF have had some different views, but I would say that in terms of outside those particular areas, you will, you, because per sales prices aren't there, you will not make a profit and the CAF are, are right. On page 19, we set out some sensitivity around here in terms of uh, what, what is happening. At present, if you look at the 0%, it's about average 20,000 per unit. But if sales prices went up by 5%, the profit would increase to 30,000. If sales prices went up by 10%, the profit would go up to 40,000. So that's the dynamic of what's, of, of, of what's actually happening in the market. In terms of uh, page 20, and you know, we've seen lots of figures being quoted about um, you know, the cost of building is a, a, a typical three-bed, semi-detached house in the country. But I think one of the best that we've seen, and it's sort of, uh, also based as well in terms of our own benchmarks that we see in our portfolio, is the figures that was published January this year uh, in a report done by Anthony Foley for the uh, Society of Charters, uh, Surveyors in Ireland. And this, you know, sets out the building costs and all the constituent parts of the building costs for building a, for, for building a house. And the total construction costs of building a house is about 150,000. And then when you add in the sort of other costs, which are local authority, part five, uh, finance, etc., it adds about 46,000. If you add your profit margin of 15%, which is effectively what the market typically targets, it adds about 30,000. And then VAT takes about 30,000. So before the land is added, it costs you typically to build a 1,200 square foot house, taking all the costs and paying everybody else, it costs close to 260,000. The average land site in Dublin for that type of house is, uh, depending on location, but on average, is somewhere between 35 and 40,000. If you're in Cork, it's somewhere between 25 and 30,000, and the same, and, and the same, and, and the same, and the same in Galway. So, therefore, you are hitting 300,000 very quickly in terms of you have to get a sales price of 300,000 before you can make any profit on a typical three-bedroom uh, three bedroom house. There. One of the more interesting things here is on page 21, and this was work which was, was done by the Dublin Housing Supply and Coordination Task Force uh, here, which effectively looked at uh, the four local authorities in Dublin and said, where are the infrastructure deficits in each local authority and what would it cost, estimated cost to fix them? And if you would see here that in Finger County Council, it was identified that there's land which could deliver about 24,000 units, but there's an infrastructure cost that has to be put in of that of about 66 million euros. In Dublin City Council, there's about 5,400 units that could be delivered if infrastructure issues are resolved, costs about 48 million. In South Dublin, about 2,000 units cost about 4.7 million. It's not a huge amount of money. But in Dunleary, right down, they could deliver about 17,000 units, cost about 45 million. So therefore, at present, what this means is that there's land across the four local authorities in Dublin which have infrastructure deficits where effectively 165 million could, could actually make that land uh, a viable uh, for achieving planning and building of houses. And I think that's a very important uh, statistic. On page 22, it, uh, we just, again from the, the task force, this is publicly available information. It sort of breaks it up by each of the areas of where the number of units could be actually actually be delivered across each local authority. Again, which is which is quite interesting. In terms of uh, the NAM, our funding of the 20,000 units on a commercial on a commercial basis, 78% of them we believe will be in Dublin. 15% will be in the commuter belt, and 7% will be outside the Greater Dublin area, maybe Cork and Galway. And our, all our focus really is on starter, is on the starter home market. On page 24, in terms of what we're doing in, uh, in NAMA, uh, since 2014, there's about 2,800 uh, units being delivered all across the country. There's currently about 3,100 units under construction by our debtors. Uh, there's planning permission granted uh, uh, of about 5,200 units. And, we've pl and there's planned applications lodged of over 5,000, and we are working actively with our debtors to get planning into local authorities for about another 6,600 units. And outside of that, uh, there is Land Bank, which uh, could potentially deliver maybe another 25,000 units, but it has infrastructure deficits, and a lot of that land is tied up in these four local authorities in Dublin where, the, where this is required. 
In terms of uh, one of the issues that's been put out there is another myth is that we're hoarding land and if we only release more land into the market that the private sector would avail of the, of the opportunity and build. The reality is that since the start of, of 2014, in 24 months, uh, we have sold over 20, uh, land which could deliver 20,000 units into the private sector. And, uh, and we keep a monitor on, on that land about what's happening of it. And only 1,100, about 5% of that land has been built on at present. And you ask the reasons why, or why didn't the people who bought it build on it? Uh, sometimes there might be uh, issues that people are looking at for re revised planning or wait for a new county or, or area or development plan. Uh, yeah, sometimes there might be a, an issue about that, uh, looking at densities and you know saying this and can we uh, look at a revised planning application, have more uh, semi-detached houses rather than, than apartments as such, uh, which requires new planning application. Infrastructure uh, constraints are certainly there, but I suppose one of the bigger issue, one of the biggest issues, and I know the committee has discussed it. If we've been looking at your transcripts, uh, really, is that there is an issue here about people buying land, effectively looking for a higher rate of return. That has to be a, a big, a big feature in my, in, in my view. In terms of, uh, I suppose, we move forward to page 27. Uh, in terms of where NAMA is at present. Uh, we have 81% of our, of our senior debt repaid. We want to pay 100% off by 2018. That gets rid of the contingent liability of the state, which now stands at 5.5 five and, five and billion euros. Uh, we want to pay back our rest of our debt by uh, March 2020 as a sub-debt. And at the, uh, we're projecting uh, that at the end of uh, NAMA's life, uh, there will be a surplus which will be available to the minister, which is uh, and which is already provided for in the NAMA legislation in 2009. If you look at section 60 of, of the NAMA Act, which effectively the surplus goes back to, to the minister, and uh, we estimate that will be uh, 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 at least two billion euros. And I suppose in 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 in, in uh, s summary, we are involved in some high-profile activities in both residential and also in terms of the Dublin Docklands, and we believe we have an important role to play, uh, but we do recognise that there's a, a huge issue uh, 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 around the need for housing, and we're doing our very best, and we'll continue to do our very best to do what we can. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. Mr. Daly, Mr. McDonough, thank you for the presentations and in particular for the factual content of the numbers included. I think the committee will find that uh, very useful. A number of colleagues at this stage have indicated that they have questions. So, Deputy O'Dowd, if you'd like to. Thank you, Chairman. Start. I'd like to welcome now. And I say I'm very interested in the statistics and figures you've provided. And indeed, it's a very clear indication of the work that you have actually done as opposed to what. Uh, people think you might be doing or not doing. But I have two major questions for you. One is you've identified in the GDA basically 164 million euros worth of infrastructure development. Now, the Minister of Finance, I think he said here that there'll be 100 million uh, provided for infrastructure deficits. And I note you also say that all that 164 isn't required on the stream immediately. Uh, so the vehicle, who would be, you know, who would, because of the seriousness of the crisis, uh, would you think it ought to be, rather than disparate people handing it in local authorities or whatever, that should be one-stop shop for dealing with the infrastructure deficit? In other words, uh, perhaps an organisation like yourself or like the National Billing Agency, I think, in years past, uh, dealt with housing construction issues related to it. And the other question I have for you is in relation to the local authority non-take-up of housing units. I mean, it's a, it's a, I'm, actually, I'm absolutely surprised that uh, you have 2,457 uh, units of accommodation that you deemed could have been available uh, for local authorities to take up. And if you look at the list of local authorities that you gave us, uh, the ones who haven't taken up the most are, in fact, the ones that have the greatest demand uh, around Dublin City, uh, the, you know, the, Fingal County, uh, the county areas around Dublin, also Cork City and, surprisingly, Wexford as well. So what is the issue there? I mean, if you have homes which, are, which you say will be deemed you will make ready for occupation, I can't see it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me that those councils would refuse homes which are in the areas that they're needed. They're you know they're, they're what we actually need. And the last point I want to make is that you you spoke uh, about your your commercial remit. 
Um, and I accept and acknowledge that, and you also have, and you acknowledge in your work, your social remit. But the real question is this, in terms of building and keeping control of prices of houses, if you can borrow as cheaply as possible, that's the key to your work, really. In other words, you will have a commercial remit if your income is greater than, you know, than, than your loan uh, charge, isn't that it? If you could borrow 1% or 2% uh, to build houses, it would make a huge difference to the cost of those homes. And do you have a comment on that, please? Just as you're replying to that, specifically Deputy O'Dowd's uh, point about the house, the units that were not taken up by the local authorities, because this committee feels that an, you know, 800 or 1,000 units immediately in Dublin would do an awful lot towards people who are currently staying in hostels and B&Bs, that as a, you know, as a, a crisis and an emergency measure, and I suppose the, quest, the specific question is, are any of those units as we sit here today available or have they all been dealt with and disposed of in other manners? Maybe, maybe if it's okay with you, Deputy, I will ask the Chairman first. Is that okay with you? Is that okay? Just, just on that, Chairman, we have 6,000 uh, completed residential units uh, left in our portfolio. I said they're about 99 per cent occupancy. They're rented by the private sector. There's frictional left over where sometimes people move out and, and things like that. And we've been combing, we, we, we constantly comb that portfolio to see if, the, if there's units available. And uh, we don't have 800 or 1,000 as sure, as sure Deputy, but we do believe that over a period of time that we probably could get our debtors receivers effectively if, if when people leave them, if they become free, that it might be potentially for a few hundred that we actually might build additional, that we might build out, out of that 6,000. The reality is that if people are in there and are renting them already, you can't displace them because you'll add, you'll add to thousand problem. I hope that answers your question, Chairman. In terms of uh, Deputy, Deputy O'Dowd, I mean, what you asked there is about whether there should be a, a central agency. I mean, that's a policy question, obviously, for the, for the government, and I'm, and I'm precluded from talking about policy, but I would talk about it in general terms. I think what you, you, you actually see is that when you've had centralised agencies with specific purposes, like the National Roads Authorities, to get on to this, effectively they build a particular focus to it, and they, they make things happen, and they learn from their experiences as go along, and they get better at it, and I think you know that maybe has merit, but that's a government policy decision. You would appreciate where we're coming from there. In terms of local authorities' uh, de uh, decline, I mean, you know, we've heard it said that you know sometimes the units offered by NAMA were rubbish. We've heard people saying that, and, you know, things this. And what we say to that is actually they aren't. They might be half completed housing developments. They might be unfinished housing estates. We started off 2010 in our portfolio with 335 unfinished housing estates. We've put the money in. That's down to 29 today. We finished off those housing estates. We put in the, all the infrastructure around them in terms of landscaping, finish off the houses and the pictures there, or some of them were unfinished housing estates in 2010. We, can, we will agree a site resolution plan with the local authority and put the money in uh, and, and make it that it's up to current building standards. So we don't accept uh, that at all. One of the biggest issues that we're with that, that we're hearing back is that sometimes in certain locations in some of the counties listed there isn't a huge demand for it, and we'd, we'd, we'd fully accept that. But if you look at the bigger urban areas where there is a huge, a, a huge crisis, one of the biggest things we're hearing back is that we already have a very high concentration of social housing in in those particular areas, and it's uh, we you know we're, we've they have an overall policy of around 20 percent, and they would, they generally don't want to go 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 above that. But again, that's a a policy that's a, a policy you need in local authority or for or for government to sort of say, listen, you know, you have to do something different. But what we do is offer them up, and you know, if people don't take them, just to, to local authority, you offer the houses, right? Yeah. And they're saying no that they have too many local authorities. Yeah, it's one of the primary there. reasons why they turn them down. Yeah. Well, that's not acceptable to me personally, and okay. I appreciate you, you yeah. can't comment that, but that's yeah. not acceptable. Mm. The other point is, could they not be used for affordable homes or starter homes? Or yeah. But they're not flex should they not be flex How in the name of God can local authorities turn down a roof but for families? That's what they're doing. Uh, well, definitely, yeah. I agree with you. Uh, I think the huge issue here, and the evidence has been, as soon as the local authority turns it down, I mean, we hold the units back with our debtors and uh, say, listen, hold that back until the local authority comes back and keep it vacant in case they want it. But the reality is that as soon as the local authority turns it down and our debtor then puts it out for rental into the private sector, it is snapped up in 24 hours. 
you know, so I mean, that's that's the issue. Your third uh, um, question uh, uh, is about uh, effectively our commercial remit. Uh, yes, we have that. The reality is that NAMA has has not borrowed any more money since it, since its inception. Uh, we bought, we, uh, we paid the banks with these government guaranteed bonds. It's, uh, it starts out at 30 billion. We're now, we've now paid off 25. We're down to 25, uh, 5 billion left, and the plan is to pay that off by by 2018. I mean, the reality is, you know, the borrowing vehicle for the government is the National Treasury Management Agency, and it's up to the Minister of Finance in terms of if they want to borrow more money. But we all know the rates in the market are present. You can borrow 10-year money at whatever 0.8%. Um, it is unprecedented how cheap that money is when the average, long-term average, was around uh, five and a half, six percent. If you go back over any series a series of time, and I suppose the issue is that again is a policy matter for government about whether they want to borrow money in this cheaper interest rate environment and and use it for for that purposes. But I can see where you come from, Deputy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. Uh, Deputy Canny. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, uh, thank you for your presentation, and again, very factual, and you um, can see the numbers, so we can decipher that for ourselves. Um, you have a plan to build 20,000 uh, new houses between 2016 and 2020. Do you have a number for each year that you are building? How that's going to progress? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question I have for you is. Um, you talk about that land that's available in the Greater Dublin area, 48,000 euros can be built with an investment of 165 million in uh, development to get the sites ready for, for shovel ready. Is there an issue where we have sites where, even with the extension of the planning permission that we have in place at the moment, the planning permission is running out on sites? And I'm asking for your comment on this. If that planning permission was extended by another three to five years, would it keep more land with plan permission available for building on? Um, the other concern I have is that we have a huge, we talk about land banks, but we have a lot of land that you, that you have sold yourselves. The people who now own it, is there a, a holding position there where they're waiting for prices to go up before they will actually bring commence housing? Uh, I've read about one particular house building company who have on 20% of the available land in the Dublin greater area. And I think in 2015 they built seven or eight, maybe 15 houses And in 2015. And this year they've so far built 35. And is there, do you fear that there may be a holding game? And is there any way we can flush these people out to get building quicker, um, I suppose? Um, and the last thing, I'll just ask you about your own uh, cash situation. Um, as NAMA, you know, at the end of the process, you will have two billion surplus. Uh, that's the target. Um, reading that there. At the moment, if you have cash um, in the bank, let's say, could some of that cash be used to be invested, or who would make decision in, in this 165 million that's needed to develop this, this land to make it make it available? I'm just looking at ways of trying to. Um, get land available so there's no barriers. And the last question, I don't know that I pick it up right, you're saying that at the moment you feel that in the private sector that the developers could have a profit margin on housing at the moment of 20,000 per unit, which is disputed by the CIF. Is that based on the average size house of 12, 1,300 square feet? That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Deputy Kenny. Okay. Uh, Mr. Daly, Mr. McDonough, would you ever? I, sp I, I suppose in terms of the number of units, 2016, 2020, I mean, obviously it's a massive <laughs> operation to try and fund delivery of 20,000 units by 2020. Of those 20,000 units, about 14,000 of those 20,000 are currently commercially viable at today's prices. About 6,000 we think will come viable between, between now and 2020. By the, uh, in 2000, by the end of 2016, we'll have about 2,500 delivered. And then, you know, next year we'd hope to get a, to get up to three and a half thousand, and uh, that'd be six thousand. And then the fourteen thousand then has to be delivered over the, rema over the remaining years on average, because we'd be ramping up our operations. And obviously, our debtors as well have to 
uh, build up their, uh, their platforms again because they ran down their platforms to, during the recession. They have to recruit more, uh, you know, carpenter, uh, more carpenters and plumbers and uh, bricklayers or whatever, or whatever, or whatever they need, or get subcontractors. So that's what we're, we're doing there. In terms of the planning permission uh, extension, I mean, that was already provided for when the NAM Act was provided in 2000 to 2009. And, and there was a subsequent, I think, uh, local government act which says that you could you, you could apply for plan permission to extend it. And you are correct in saying that maybe some of that plan permission might be coming towards maturity. And you know, does it make sense again to look at maybe extending that again? That's a policy matter, but it's something that may help. But I suppose sometimes a lot of the plan permissions which were got in 2000 up to up to 2008, 2009 were for the, the wrong type uh, uh, of product. It was for a different time. It was for a, a time when effectively it was primarily, uh, primarily apartments and uh, apartments maybe in locations maybe that it just doesn't work. People don't want apartments in those locations uh, uh, and that maybe more um, uh, family type housing would be, be more appropriate. So there are certainly some plant permissions that would benefit from that. And everything can, that can be done that can help is worth doing rather than submit a new planning application because you're back into the whole planning process again of people appealing and going to board plan all and you know the timeline from having a raw site today to actually having somebody on site if there's an appeals all the way along the process is two years so that's a very long time when you've got a crisis in the market if you think this so i i, I think deputy that's a good point that you, that you, that you make in terms Sorry, of just before uh, brendan goes on on that that planning point there is maybe one other thing that, that could be said and that is we've we've had a very good experience in dublin in our work in the docklands because of the docklands strategic development zone and that approach certainly is possible in other areas particularly in dublin and that actually streamlines the whole process and uh, it, it avoids a lot of the whole appeal, reappeal process that, that Brendan has talked about. And there's one site in fact in Dublin which is in the uh, glass bottle site which you know, has the potential to deliver maybe 2,000, 3,000 housing units. But there is no progress on getting to the stage where there's a plan for that area. Now we would be strongly of the view that designating that as a strategic development zone would certainly move things along much quicker than is likely to happen under the, the present uh, system. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Deputy, you asked a question about new owners and, and you know and, hold, and hoarding land and what can be done to make them build. I mean, as I said in that page, if I can find it, Deputy, I mean, there's lots of, it's on page 25, I mean, there's lots of reasons why people may, may, may hoard lands. Clearly, there is an element of people sitting back and saying prices will go up and I'll make more, I'll make more profit. And that doesn't necessarily mean that those people will actually build the houses. It'll just mean that if the prices of the houses go up, then effectively the price of the land is a multiplier that they might just say they'll sell on the land again in the future, uh, but just wait for house prices to go up because that will that, that will cause that. And and you know there are mechanisms already in place where effectively uh, legislation passed already which says that there's a provision for a vacant site levy and that will talk about introducing that towards the end of this decade. And again, that is something maybe uh, you know I'm very reluctant in in, term, in terms of giving people disincentives, uh, proposing giving people disincentives to build. But I think, you know, the, uh, again, calibration is a great thing in terms of saying, you know, it will happen if you don't do, if you don't do something with it. And I think that's something that's, that's, that, that's very useful. In, ter in, in, terms, in terms of our cash, I mean, all our cash is earmarked for actually building uh, at present or for, paying, or for paying back our debt. And we can't use our cash to fund uh, this infrastructure deficit. If, if, if it's a case that it's now it's, it's now a debtor's land, we have to, we, the way we use our cash is that we lend the debtor more money, which he uses to pay the local authority for contributing towards that, that infrastructure, and we do that. But on the basis, then we can get our money back. Uh, obviously, that would have to be a commercial thing. And uh, uh, your final question, uh, I think, it was about uh, the, the profit of twenty thousand. Uh, per unit. I mean, that's on average. I mean, the reality is that you look, people always be able to produce schemes and say, I only could make 10,000 uh, per unit on, in, on this type of house in this development. But I mean, the thing about 
schemes is that you typically have you know three and four and five bedroom houses within the scheme and and on the smaller houses you might be making an average maybe twelve to fourteen thousand profit and a four bedroom house you might be making twenty two to twenty five profit and a five bedroom house which might be very few uh, you might be making forty thousand profit so on average you get around you get around to about twenty thousand to twenty thousand profit I mean what it comes down to of course really at the end of the day is the cost of the land so if somebody is overpaid for the land in the first place then you know that's going to they're going to have a bigger side cost and that's going that's going to, going to reduce uh, reduce their profit but i think one of the useful things uh, um, has been has been that the central bank measures in terms of prudential measures in terms of reducing uh, the size of mortgages that, that people can do has certainly has a stabilising effect in terms of uh, generally in terms of the price of land uh, because it's completely linked to the price of houses and if people can't can't get the mortgages they can't buy the houses. But again, I would have my own views about the calibration of that. But but as a measure, I think it's it, it, will, it, it, will, it was a useful to, it's a useful tool. I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. Deputy Cowan. Sorry, just oh, sorry, just final, final just um, a reaction to. You said about the um, gearing people, contractors up. If there's a huge building programme for the next five years, in your experience, in your view, do we have the people, the tradesmen, to, or do you see that as being a difficulty? It, it, I mean, it is a difficulty because, I mean, because a lot, a, a, a lot of people have immigrated, but we have, we have talked to uh, some uh, our major um, debtors and they have said that they actually have the names and email addresses of, 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 of all the people who used to work for them who went abroad UK Australia wherever wherever the work was where, in the Middle East when there was no jobs here and they said that a lot of these people would definitely come back to Ireland and work in Ireland prefer to work in Ireland and raise their children in Ireland except the, except the issue is that they're not going to come back if they only see 12 to 18 months of pipeline of work that they can give them. But if they could see a way that they would have funding available or that they could build product and they could keep going for five years, it would give everybody a bit of certainty and, and they believe that a lot of these people, uh, people would come back. There certainly is a scarcity of people, maybe at present because there hasn't been many people doing trades during, during the recession, but uh, all our big clients have said, listen, if we knew we had um, visibility that we could have five years work we will get the people it will take us a while I guess that's why it will take us a while for us to ramp up in terms of delivery but they said they will get the people if they had that certainty and, and that's why Deputy that now uh, you know bringing certainty to this view that we will fund 20,000 houses between now and 2020 that's very important to the debtors we're working with in terms of that certainty about a pipeline of funding which they can transfer back to the people with the skills that they need. But I mean, in terms of the three and a half or 3,600 houses that are under construction, funded by NAMA at the moment, uh, they're spread, I think, across, I haven't the figure, but I might 45 be totally accurate, 45, 46 sites. Uh, and they're functioning. So the skills are there. I'm not saying it's not a challenge for the debtors to actually service every site, but it can be done. And the more certainty there is about funding to the future, and we're saying quite clearly we have the funding